people draw a distinction between the last mayor and this mayor, but on the handling of Garner, have we have we seen anything that really distinguishes you know, the de Blasio approach from the Bloomberg approach? Well, I would say one thing that isn't all that different is, is Mayor de Blasio inviting Reverend Al Sharpton to City Hall for the summit. I know a lot was made of that, particularly from police unions who were upset about it. But Mayor Bloomberg had also invited uh, Reverend Sharpton to talk about issues like these to City Hall before something Reverend Sharpton has brought up many times and going back and forth with uh, the police union. One, one area where I do think it's different, though, is in the city council, we're seeing a real willingness from Commissioner Bratton to come and to testify to the city council, answer their questions. Um, that's something that didn't happen very often with Ray Kelly, and when it did, things didn't always go very smoothly. There, there wasn't such a friendly uh, relationship between the two of them, but now I, I think there's been a real willingness to engage. Now, whether that leads to actual results or change remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, I think the difference with de Blasio is, I, I did a story last week about how the mayor still has this overwhelming support among mm -hmm. black voters. And I was really shocked, given what happened with the Garner case and given the fact that he ran on ending stop and frisk, uh, that 65% that of black voters still approve of, of the mayor's uh, job performance. and. Even more surprising, 70% were like, he understands pr the problems of people like them. Um, and so I think what de Blasio has that maybe Bloomberg might not have had as much of is kind of that benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I, I talked to uh, Reverend Daughtry in Brooklyn, and that's, that's what he said. He said, um, you know, he's a mayor who cares, so I'm going to give him a chance. And, I, you know, I, under Bloomberg, I'm not sure there would have been as much of a chance to kind of deal with the situation, to kind of um, talk to people, to kind of hold these two meetings right. that he did with Reverend Sharpton. So, I mean, that's a huge, huge advantage that de Blasio has right now. I think it's also a matter of de Blasio is better at relating to everyday people, um, or at least appears to be better at relating to everyday people, people than Mayor Bloomberg was. Um, and I, I think that's all kinds of people yeah. across the board. You know, Mayor Bloomberg was known for many things. One of them wasn't really his ability to go out there and, yeah, and make no. people feel like he understood their problems. Um, and I think that's part of the big difference here too, just kind of an overall different um, perception of the mayor, yeah. uh, of this mayor compared to the last one in the public. Yeah, and you know, they're two different animals. You know, de Blasio is, is a, a creature of retail politics, you know, this is right. what he's been doing for, you know, how many, uh, you know, a couple decades now. He's been out there. He knows how to, uh, you know, navigate these situations, uh, look at the polls. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe there was a Quinnipiac poll that came out at the end of August, and I think a majority of people said they supported this sort of idea of using uh, broken windows, which is kind of um, targeting people for smaller crimes right. to prevent larger ones. And, you know, de Blasio has held fast to that idea that broken windows works. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a difficult position to hold when you ran on ending right, right. stop and frisk, which many people say is just an offshoot of the broken windows sort of theory. So um, he's a smart guy. You know, he's, he's looking at public consensus on this issue and kind of, you know, deciding that he can still stay on this track. Right. And I think he also feels like the crime issue is the one that he has to play very carefully because that's the one that could really hurt him. You know, there's this right. preconceived notion that a liberal Democrat is going to be soft on crime or we're going to see like a Dinkins return in terms of high violence in the city. Right. And I mean, I, I guess that goes to the very choice of Bratton as commissioner is trying to kind of find someone who bought him credibility on that. And I, I don't think you can get Bratton and not get broken windows. I mean, they kind of come <laughs> in a package, right. yeah. you know, a package deal. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about you mentioned stop and frisk, and I think another part of what makes it different for the mayor is, is that, it, you know, the incidents of high-profile police violence never occur in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You know, if Louima and Diallo and Doris Mond had happened and Giuliani wasn't notoriously tough on crime, it would have felt very different. And for Bloomberg, I feel like when Sean Bell was shot, he, very similar to de Blasio, uh, came out very quickly and, and made it pretty clear that he thought something wrong had happened. Um, but that was in 2006, and that was really before anyone was really talking about stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. And then the last six or seven years of his term were about stop and frisk, whereas de Blasio comes in having ended that. I mean, that's like a big, you know, definitely a big part of the, the background, I feel. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, he does get that benefit of the doubt. Uh, the other thing I thought Adam said, Eric Adams said that was very interesting was that de Blasio is going after low-hanging fruit. So he is doing his part to stop stop and frisk. He's, you know, he's followed through on that campaign promise. So that 
only buys him more time to kind of work this situation out. You know, mm -hmm. people are still unsure where he's going to fall on policing. You still have some people upset with his choice of Bratton, but the fact is, his uh, job approval rating among African Americans is is uh, his approval rating uh, among African Americans on police community relations is over fifty percent. For Bratton, it's around forty percent, I believe. So. And part of it, too, is I think how they present broken windows, right? Mm -hmm. When you hear them talk about it, you know, Commissioner Bratton uses this example a lot of, well, if you call the police because there's a loud party going on next door to your home and it's 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and you can't sleep, should we not come and, and quiet down? And I think that is part of why you see this continued support in polls for broken windows, is nobody wants a quality of life crime happening right. next door. I think the real concern with broken windows um, as has been expressed by many, is whether or not it's being equally enforced. Is that being enforced in the south shore of Staten Island the same way it's being enforced in the north shore right. of Staten Island where Eric Garner was being arrested for allegedly selling loose cigarettes? Um, you know, that, that's the real crux of the problem there. But as Bratton pointed out, and I mean, his entire, the architecture of New York City's crime drop, at least in Bratton's opinion, is based on broken windows and is based on the idea that a small crime can lead to a big crime. And he, in citing that house party example, pointed out that breaking up a house party on the North Shore of Staten Island recently, police found an AK-47 on the front lawn. So it was probably for the best of everyone in the neighborhood that the police showed up. But right. nonetheless, um, that doesn't mean that people are okay with Eric Garner being arrested, you know, 30-some odd times for the same crime. And that's led to a lot of discussion about you can do broken windows without arresting people. Right, and in that's fact, been by, this big by, discussion yeah, by definition, right. you actually uh, don't necessarily arrest people. And I think, too, and, and I don't know if, if you found this, but um, in reporting about stop and frisk, uh, especially in low-income communities of color, people's views on it were really much more nuanced than, mm -hmm. than what we would think. Uh, right. People were upset the number of stops and kind of the, the quality of the stops, like the attitude of the officers and stuff. Mm -hmm. But especially um, middle class, middle aged, and older people very much wanted an aggressive police presence because they remembered, you know, very violent past, and they were worried right. about their safety. And it, so I wonder if part of the reason why you see um, De Blasio having good, amazingly solid support in the African American community, despite still supporting broken windows, is that there's some pretty nuanced feelings about crime and policing even within that community. Yeah, you know, African Americans are not uh, monolithic at all, and um, you go into certain communities in and, and Brooklyn and Upper Manhattan that are plagued by violence, and you surprisingly found a lot of support for stop and frisk. You know, people wanted uh, people who were carrying illegal and using illegal guns, they wanted them arrested, they want them off the street, they want to be able to walk down the street with their grandchildren and their children and not worry about, you know, shots um, flying out, but I think um, you know, during the, the hearing, council hearing when Bratton was there, he talked, he did talk a lot about uh, being able to handle certain situations without bringing people to arrest, without bringing it to a mm -hmm. conflict where there's a, you know, armed struggle. And I think that's what some of the training, that's what he's pitching that some of the, some of that training is going to actually be about. And I think with stop and frisk, you know, people were just upset that it seemed like why stop me every day? You know, if you've, I see the same officer, people right. have been stopped six, seven, eight times by the same officer. Yeah. So I think people want to be safe in their communities, but they don't want to be harassed. And uh, this new phrase that Mayor de Blasio has been using is protect and respect, I guess, in terms, in terms of police. Which rhymes. Which yes, rhymes. it does yeah, rhyme. It's very <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's what people are, I mean, that's, that's the idea that he's pushing. We're going to provide police protection but do it in a constitutional way, as Bratton said uh, during that council hearing. The council hearing was also interesting because, um, as you mentioned earlier, it probably would it wouldn't have happened <laughs> under the previous administration. Right. But, <laughs> yeah. but the fact that uh, the commissioner actually mentioned that there needs to be a sort of fundamental shift, I believe he said, in, in how police interact with the community. Um, and he talked about, you know, not relying on arrests as much. Um, and, you know, some of the council members, like uh, the council speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, uh, Jamani Williams, they were explicitly pushing Bratton to admit that there was a sort of friction between minority 
in the police, minorities in the police community. And while he didn't explicitly come out and say that, he did come out and say, well, there needs to be this fundamental shift. Mm -hmm. And so the council speaker kind of saw that as a victory. You know, right, she saw right, that as right. a, a real sea change in how the relationship had existed before uh, between the police and, you know, the council. And Yeah, so I wasn't there. Uh, what did, you know, what did, I've been at, I was at some of the, the Ray Kelly v. Melissa Mark Viverito fights in the earlier era, but what was it like? Was it cordial? Was it tense? Was it awkward? I wasn't in the room. I thought it was surprisingly cordial. I did too. Uh, um, I, I was kind of sitting there waiting for the fireworks, particularly because some of these very members who were, who were at the council hearing had been standing out front protesting broken windows uh, at some points. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, but it, it was very cordial for, for quite some time. I mean, I think there were certain issues where things got a little heated, um, the issue of chokeholds, right. um, that thing, things got a little bit... Um, Tense there, Rory Lanceman brought that up and asked whether the commissioner might look to make uh, chokeholds illegal. They're, they're prohibited by the NYPD, but they're not against the law. Um, and that was one of a, a handful of very heated exchanges. The commissioner does not want to do that and in sort of a flippant tone said, um, you know, if you would like to do that, good you, luck. You won't have my support. <laughs> good luck, right. but you won't have my support. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, saying that, um, and not having like the room explode, that, I was surprised because, you know, there was a little grumble throughout the room when he right. said he wouldn't support a law to make them illegal. But nothing like the big sort of, you know, accusations or you know, you're supporting this horrible policy that's hurting people. Um, so I mean, I think that too shows how that relationship between the council and Brighton has changed versus the relationship that Kelly had with with the council right. as well. I wonder if that'll hold up. Yeah, I, I never tend to think that collegial <laughs> relationships in politics hold up um, the longer you go on. But I also think that the council is happy that Bratton is coming to their hearings, and I, I think they want to pay him respect, and I think that he's been respectful to them right. in a way that they perhaps didn't feel respected before. Um, yeah. I mean, there were many, in many different um, city agencies, many tense moments where people clearly did not want to be there to testify uh, to the city council under previous administrations. And this is certainly a change of tone. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, we saw Jamani Williams pushed back pretty hard on the idea that a citizen should never resist arrest, although kind of ultimately agreed. Right. Because um, that's been another ongoing issue. Um, and then, of course, two hours into a hearing that was mainly everybody agreeing with one another, the police commissioner made some news and said that he wanted more than a 1,000 new police officers <laughs> right. after turning that down. But even there, but that, it wasn't... No one, no one jumped on that either. No, it yeah, wasn't no one confrontational. Put, I mean, after the hearing, the, the council speaker said, well, you know, we'll have to see. We'll have to see whether his justification stands up, which, you know, the commissioner said he needed these extra cops so he could provide, do this sort of training in relation to what happened to Eric Garner so that he could better train cops and that the overtime cost would be, what, $25, $30 million a I year. So, yeah. so you need these additional cops in order to kind of provide this new level um, right. of training. So, you know, even after the hearing, she still had a kind of, well, we'll see, we'll see. Is it in the budget? Can they do it without it? You know, so it didn't sound like a no right. at all. You know, it didn't sound like a get out of here. We're not getting those, but still open to it. Yeah. I wonder if it's something that can be, you know, the cultural issue about like how police relate to communities, particularly minority communities. I wonder if that's something that can be trained out of cops. I mean, I, I don't know. Well, perhaps the, the bigger factor there is that police, the police force in New York City is becoming increasingly yeah. black and Hispanic and yeah. decreasingly white, um, much like the rest of the city. And that will surely uh, change how police interact with members of their community. I, I don't think anybody doubts that. But I also, I mean, part of that training will be focused not even so much on relating to different communities, although I think that's part of it, but just in general de-escalation techniques, right? right? So that when a police officer and, and a you know, person on the street have an, have an encounter, maybe we don't need to get to an arrest, right? Maybe we can talk this down and calm this down before we need to arrest anybody. And then if we do need to go to arrest, let's figure out how we're going to do that without using any force. And then if we have to use force, how are we going to do that without hurting anybody? That, that was what um, the commissioner outlined in this hearing. And I, I think it was generally well received, um, mm -hmm. his, his outline of the training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the critics want to see a fundamental shift in police culture, which means that, I mean, even though the force is growing more minority, you can 
be in a culture that right, just right. views a certain neighborhood a certain way. Right. So I think that will require a sort of shift in the department and how they view neighborhoods. And, you know, that can deal with things like um, neighborhood policing. You know, maybe police need to be in these neighborhoods more often as opposed to, you know, what was happening with uh, Operation Impact where right. people are just kind of parachuting, parachuting in, in exactly right. to these neighborhoods and kind of, you know, don't understand it. You know, it looks different if you, you know, you stand on the corner in any particular neighborhood, it's going to look different to you. The, the third week as opposed to the first week. You're gonna right. see things, you're gonna notice things. And I think, I think that's what people want. People just wanna be respected. I was thinking that this is, uh, to some degree, you know, one thing that distinguishes the de Blasio era from the Bloomberg era is how center stage Brooklyn is. You know, it's the mayors from Brooklyn, um, public advocates from Brooklyn, and I guess a lot of the players in this drama, even though it happened at Staten Island, are from Brooklyn too. I mean, Jemani Williams, taught, you know, right. who, who from the borough has staked out a position that uh, is interesting on this? Um, I think Jemani Williams has been pretty vocal on this. You know, like there's, you know, because the, this administration and the council is so allied, you know, you, uh, you know, I think the response might have been different if it was Bloomberg in the office. Right. You might have heard a lot more yelling. But I think uh, Jumani has done a good job of raising these issues about race, about you know arrest, about treatment. Um, so he's been very vocal on that. And then of course Tish James with her uh, body camera proposal, I think that was very timely to kind of come out and say let's let's not just do this in a few precincts, let's expand it widely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she's been she's been very vocal as well. And worth noting, Jumani Williams has some personal experience. Um, with this issue being arrested several years back while at he was a councilman Indian, at the West Indian right. Day Parade. Right. Um, so to watch him and, and Commissioner Bratton go back and forth about what, what you should do when you're being arrested for a crime you didn't commit right. um, was really interesting. I mean, that adds, that adds different depth than maybe somebody who hasn't been in the position uh, that, that Jumani has. Um, I think, you know, another, um, another Brooklyn uh, councilman, Robert Carnegie, really went back and forth with... Uh, Commissioner Bratton at the council hearing over the issue of subway performers, um, which is something sort of a, a broken windows uh, policy, but maybe a little beyond that, um, that uh, Police Commissioner Bratton has really looked to crack down on. He is, does not support um, dancing on the subway for money or for not, or uh, he does not like the it's showtime call that we've all probably heard on the four, five, six. Um, a few times, yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, I think Councilman Cornegie, you know, kind of pushed him, why do we have to arrest these kids? Can't we give them a summons? I understand it's against the rules. And uh, Commissioner Bratton just sort of politely said that they were not going to agree. They were not going to find common ground on that issue. Um, so he, he's, he's been fairly outspoken as well. I mean, there's been a handful of Brooklyn politicians who have showed up at these, uh, at these you know, rallies and things like that. And I think yeah. Borough President um, Eric Adams is, is also a really interesting right. figure. He's a, a former police right. officer. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So he, he's brought a very, I think, nuanced um, uh, and often very fun to listen to. Uh, he has yeah. a real way with words. Um, he likes to rhyme pretty often. <laughs> Uh, he, he's brought he's brought a really interesting angle to the conversation as well. I was reading before uh, coming coming out today some of the stuff about the polling. You mentioned some of the polls mm -hmm. about reaction to broken windows and the reaction to the the Garner thing uh, in general, and the racial divide. You know, I think ninety percent of blacks thought there was no excuse for what happened. Uh, in, in Staten Island, 71% of Latinos and 52% of whites. So you could look at that a couple different ways. One is that most people of all races think something messed up happened. The other is that there's a pretty stark um, divide among the races. And I mean, you could ascribe those to some obvious things, but then if you think about it again, like why exactly do we, um, and I'm white, as you might have noticed, uh, <laughs> right. why, why do we feel so differently about it? I mean, is it just about people having had a personal experience with it or just like the inability to empathize? Like, it puzzles me that we could all look at that same video and see what happened and hear him call out and have such different reactions based on our race. I just, in the end, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the fact that, you know, de Blasio is uh, treating African-Americans as a very serious constituency that 
that should be heard, that will be heard, that he will respond to their concerns. I, you know, that's a big change from previous administrations. You know, even though I thought Bloomberg kind of started out well doing that, it got really rugged towards the latter years mm -hmm. um, of his terms. Uh, you know, I was asking this very question. I was talking to a, a source, and I said, "Well, why do you think there's this this huge divide in black support for for Devazio and white support?" And it was interesting. The the person thought that because. Um, Bloomberg was more of a kind of professional managerial sort of mayor. You know, he was going to run City Hall like a business uh, that certain maybe white voters had come used to that. Yeah. And now that de Blasio's there, it's clear that he understands ethnic politics in the city, uh, retail politics. He's going he's gonna to use those angles. So there's a, a kind of fear that maybe uh, that's, there's going to be a lessening of that sort of professional managerial style of running mm -hmm. City Hall, and maybe white voters prefer, prefer that sort of style more. So I, th I thought that was an interesting uh, possibility. Yeah. I think, I think people's experience with police, do, it does really factor into how they watch that video. I mean, to me, it's sort of a universally kind of gripping thing to watch. Um, and the way that question is phrased, you know, do you think there's any excuse or any, any reason you know, I suppose that there are people right, who think could, that there could have been right. that think maybe the police thought that this was going to be dangerous, or certainly I don't think that the police thought it would end the way that it did. Yeah. And I, I think there are people who genuinely believe that police ought to be able to use all different kinds of maneuvers to take somebody down. And, and you know, I, I think so much of the discussion you've had before that poll took place factors into people's answer to that question, right? right? If, that, if the person who was being polled doesn't really believe that was a chokehold or doesn't really believe, you know, that that Mr. Garner shouldn't have been arrested and should have just right. been let go. They, they, that's going to influence their answer. And I do think that those those beliefs are different in, in white and black and Latino communities um, following this kind of long summer of, of talking about this case and watching that video over and over because um, it gets played every time a TV station does a story and it gets linked to whenever a newspaper does. and. It's, it's not a narrative that's going to go away anytime no. soon. And if anything, it was reinforced um, by the stuff happening in uh, Ferguson. I mean, the timing was obviously there were different incidents, different police departments, obviously no direct connection between the two, but there, there was a sense that you know, this was part of something, something larger. Right. Um, and one wonders why, you know, this, this comes up a lot in New York's history, actually. You know, the kind of like, outpouring of rage we saw in Ferguson, why that doesn't happen here. And I don't know if it's that people have other mechanisms for expressing themselves, or I don't know why we don't have sort of open violence in the face of something like this, which is, which is a good thing, obviously, but right. it's interesting. Right. Well, I mean, I think the response of what happened with Eric Garner and Ferguson was just totally different. I mean, they, they hand, the response was just much more professional. Um, and I think, you know, in Ferguson, they kind of just inflamed people by the response and you know some of the talk about you know uh, Michael Brown having robbed the store and you know all of the stuff just made people even angrier mm -hmm. and I think here you know the first thing you heard uh, Mayor de Blasio say and, and Commissioner Bratton say was it looked like a chokehold right. I mean that probably calmed a lot of people right there they said okay they saw the same thing I saw right you right, know right. and there maybe maybe this is going to get a fair shake you know, maybe this is going to get a fair hearing in the courts and that sort of thing. And whereas I think in Ferguson, people felt that, hey, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the official's response helped kind of um, increase that, that idea in people's mind that, hey, this is not going to be fair. Right. I think there's, there's another factor, too. You're looking at two really different populations, you know, certainly socioeconomically, Ferguson compared to New York. And then on top of that, you're looking at two really different police departments. Um, and the NYPD, for, for every you know, story that we've reported about difficulties communities have relating to the NYPD, since you know, the Crown Heights riots, since, since bad times like those, have really changed the way that they engage with large groups of people who might be protesting. I mean, when you looked at the March for Garner on Staten Island, the police, the only police out on the front lines were officers from the community affairs units. They were right. wearing polos with short sleeves. And you had large swarms of other police officers ready to go for a bad situation, but kept several blocks back yeah. because that's how you de-escalate a situation. And in Ferguson, right off the bat, a lot of this unrest was met with just a tremendous 
police response with tanks and, you know, like army style vehicles, that doesn't help. That makes people feel like their right to free speech is being trampled on just as they felt that, you know, um, a young man's rights had been trampled on by the police. It only inflames the situation. So I think you saw a really different reaction first, you know, from the commissioner, from the mayor, as you were saying, mm -hmm. and then, you know, on the ground in response to these major events, people felt like they were able to have their voices heard in yeah. many different ways and through many different avenues. You've had CCRB meetings, right. you've had city council hearings. Um, things have progressed in a much more orderly fashion here. Yeah, and it, it didn't hurt the mayor that he, he Sharpton. He has Sharpton's ear. Mm -hmm. You know, Sharpton at Eric Garner's funeral talked about the need for a peaceful protest at this march. Um, he participated in this meeting with uh, religious leaders, for example. All, all stuff designed to kind of, kind of uh, reduce tensions. Um, and I think that relationship with Sharpton has he's really utilized it well. I mean, in the end, I guess the message is New York is just better than any other place. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Yeah, I, I would don't agree. think we're going to disagree with yeah. you that much. Yes,